on the mic. Is it good? Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, and War Eagle. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to uh, get a chance to come back to a place that um, is my place. And uh, we've lived a lot of places uh, around the country, and um, you know th this is this is where I'm from, and this is uh, this will always be home. And we we at some point we will be back here uh, permanently. So um, want to have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit a little bit about about my story um, as it relates to uh, how the education I got received at Auburn um, sent me into a, a very unexpected direction uh, for me. And so, um, so yeah, we'll talk and then there may be some time for questions at the end and uh, hopefully you'll go away with a little bit of better idea about, uh, about uh, maybe the livestock industry in the western U.S. and how it ties back to my roots in Alabama. So I, uh, I, I threw up a collage of things that, that would relate to my time before um, becoming a student at Auburn. And I graduated from Auburn High School in, uh, in 1984. And I tell people that in the spring, I got up and went to school on the corner of Dean and Sanford. And that fall, I got up and came to school here. And it was, it was all very natural. My kids had gone through college searches and looking at different schools and different opportunities as they were seniors in high school, that was something that didn't even resonate with me because there was never a question about where I would go to school. But my background before that, was, I, I think my agriculture background started with, uh, um, with this Hampshire pig right here. Um, when, a, uh, when the ag teacher, uh, Malin Richburg at Auburn Junior High School, called one afternoon and asked me if I, as a seventh grader, if I would like to show Hampshire pigs for the FFA chapter. And uh, we had an ag background, obviously, with a dad that's a faculty in ag economics and a farm down the road in Wetumpka. And so um, it sounded like a good way to miss a lot of school. And so we went to fairs all over Alabama and Georgia showing these, these, uh, these purebred uh, Hampshire pigs. Um, that translated into something I'm very proud of, uh, which is I still have in my office today, is is this FFA jacket that, uh, that is uh, way too small now. Um, but that started a process that, uh, that centered around uh, high school and church and um, our family farm in Wetumpka where, we, where we, we grew corn for the FFA corn growing contest and we had uh, grass cattle, uh, wheat pasture type stalker operation that I was involved in. Um, I had the opportunity from when I was in say sixth grade till 12th grade to sell programs, uh, football games, which is kind of a cool thing to do growing up. Um, and then uh, turned into showing cattle and judging cattle and livestock, and then an opportunity to be part of the state officer team uh, in 1984. So uh, with that, I, uh, I showed up at Auburn uh, thinking about beef cows. And that was, we did some row crop and some commercial watermelons. There was a watermelon picture, we did commercial watermelons. I forgot to say that, but we did that growing up. And, but my, my, uh, my passion was in the cows. That's where I wanted to spend my time. And so when I showed up at Auburn, this barn that you now know is a nice, nice, nice uh, meeting area now. It was really a barn then. And uh, we had the opportunity to do some work in that. But when I showed up here, I was thinking about beef cows. Um, and. Dr. Steve Schmidt was my advisor who, who just retired uh, a few weeks back after, after uh, 40 years of service to Auburn, which is unbelievable. But uh, I, uh, I got at Auburn what I would consider a very, very strong uh, ruminant nutrition, basic nutrition background um, in animal science. And um, we had the opportunity to do a lot of hands-on stuff, a lot of theory, um, had the opportunity to do a work study um, at, the, at what was the swine breeding unit, uh, which is where the beef unit is now, and then uh, spent some time doing some work study in agronomy, working on fescue breeding, and then finally uh, made my way to where I really wanted to be, which was at the beef unit, um, back with the cows. So I enjoy the other stuff, the ag economics and the agronomy, and at the end of the day, I want to be back with the cows. And so as I went through school, everything I was thinking about is how can I find a job where I can spend time with cows. And uh, 
one of the things I put on here was I had some nutrition lab experience and that, that was actually a work study. Oh, well, it wasn't a work study, it was a special special project maybe. It was a way if you needed some hours and you had some time in between semesters and so we did a little special project um, on a lab uh, nutrition type uh, research project and so that actually got me thinking about some of that nutrition opportunity for graduate school. And so if, if Dr. Schmidt was here, I would brag on him because what he did for me was he basically said, okay, you want to go to graduate school in nutrition. And so he set up interviews for me all over, uh, schools all over the country with contacts that he had and uh, had the opportunity to, to pick from some of those and, and uh, they all would have been good. But we, uh, we made what I thought was a very, very good choice and uh, we uh, ended up uh, at Texas A&M. And uh, so before I go to Texas A&M, I want to make a point of this picture. Um, so that's, uh, that's an original IBM PC, if I'm not mistaken, about 1981, 82. So uh, my, my father, with the help of Alabama Farm Bureau in those years, uh, got a room full of those donated or purchased or something up here in the, the top top floor, last door on the right was the uh, the computer lab. And so I, timing wise, it was a really good thing for me because I can look at people that are just five years older than me in business that were, that were too early to, to take advantage of some of what I had in school. So it looks terrible now <laughs> compared to my uh, Samsung uh, Note 5 I have here in the thing, but it was really a great thing there. And it allowed me to, to get the concept of, of computing as it, as it relates to agriculture. And then there was a class that I took out of order in animal science. I took a, a feedlot nutrition class before I'd actually taken feeds and feeding, which was out of order. But in that class, I was exposed to a program called Mixit, which was a uh, ration formulation software where, where nutritionists would basically take diets and build them. And uh, Dr. Elvin Thomas was my professor for that. And, and began to plant those seeds of what it would be like to formulate rations for animals. So with that background, uh, showed up in College Station, Texas, uh, excited about Texas. Um, the agriculture is big in Texas. The farms are big, the ranches are big, uh, the feedlots are big, and the, and the dairies are big. And um, so I approached into that system a uh, master's in nutrition um, that was uh, with a gentleman there named Bill Ellis that was very much into basic ruminant nutrition physiology. And so um, we had the opportunity to work on, um, with, with cows again, we were working with, with, uh, with stalkers, yearling type animals, and we were working on how to supplement these stalker calves on pasture with uh, self-fed supplements that you didn't have to feed every day. You could go put them out in a trough and you could do it once a week and then the cattle would, would gently eat through that and not eat it all the first day. And so that was my research project uh, for my master's degree. And it was fun because I spent a tremendous amount of time with the cows. Um, we, were, uh, we, we did some stuff with cows that wasn't so fun. We did some, uh, uh, some radioactive uh, element marking where we could basically, what I describe here as a, is uh, more detail than you're probably interested in, but GI rate dynamics, where we were trying to figure out when, when, it, when a cow ate a piece of hay, how long that hay stayed in the rumen, how long it went through the intestines, and how long until it came in the manure. So we took samples all along the way. And that usually happened in the middle of the night, and that was not much fun. But the point is that I got to be with the cows, and we were, uh, we were learning more and more about, about how to feed them. My uh, interest, actually, I had in my committee at a and I had a... Uh, um, uh, had a lot of interest in agronomy, and so I had a, a, a forage grazing uh, type nutrition, but agronomy based guy that was on my committee, and got a Monty Roquette, and um, you know I had a very good base in working in the working with the fescue breeding here over in Funches, and taking crop production and forage production, and uh, even turf management. I really was into the growing side of forages, and so uh, when I found a way to tie that into the nutrition piece that I really felt at home in, from my standpoint of my subject matter. So when I could figure out a way to grow, to grow forages, silages, haze, grazing, rotational grazing, uh, cell grazing, species of grasses, uh, cool season, warm season, all of that information tying back into the details of how it's digested and how it ends up making a product, meat, uh, beef, milk, wool, 
what have you in the animal. So that was my story at Texas A&M, but it was still all about beef cows. So I had gone to A&M with the idea of getting a master's and PhD while we were in College Station, um, and I got married while I was at Auburn. My, my wife uh, was a graduate as well, and um, so we moved to College Station together, and while we were in College Station, we had our first son, and uh, so the prospects of getting a PhD and my interest level in getting a PhD kind of decrease while I was at A&M, which was very unexpected. I felt like I grew up a professor's kid. That's kind of what I thought I wanted to be. But I became intrigued by industry while I was in Texas at Texas A&M. So when I got ready to, to, to look for my first job out of graduate school, there was a group called the National Cottonseed Products Association, which was a 100-year-old entity at the time and had basically been filled with, uh, with animal science graduates, uh, masters and PhD level people that were working in the cotton industry, and it seemed kind of odd to me, but the, but the point is, is that the, the cotton plant, we think about shirts and jeans, but actually the, the, the protein and the oil inside is, 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 is equally as important, and that whole, uh, that whole area of, of products that comes out of the, not the lint, but the seed, was uh, dominated by food scientists as it relates to the oil, and then animal science as it relates to the protein and the fiber that, that ended up being put in animal feeds. So I had the opportunity to do technical writing. Uh, we funded research projects. Um, it was really fun. I got to meet a lot of people. I worked on a project. Uh, this is right here is a, is a, is a picture of, of Gossip Hall, which is a, an anti-nutrient that's in cotton products that causes problems in cows and pigs and chickens. So I got to do research projects, got to write some technical articles about that while I was very young, out of school. Uh, met a lot of people. Um, this is a great picture here. This is in Lubbock, Texas, so a lot of cotton all the way across the south, but things are big in Texas, and there's these giant piles of cotton seed. Sometimes they're in a house, sometimes they're just under an auger that ends up, you see why they shape the house like this, because that's the way it naturally falls when there's no wall. So the cotton industry was really good to me. Um, one day I woke up and I said, uh, I'm tired of sitting at a desk and going to trade shows. And um, I had met a lot of important people in this, so on a Saturday, we were living in Memphis, Tennessee at the time, I, uh, I called the gentleman that was the director of dairy research at Purina Mills, the feed company, who was on one of my committees with this organization. And I said, I'm ready to get my, my boots dirty again. I'm tired of uh, sitting in this office. And so I said, I really like the feedlots in Texas. Are you, are you, are you aware of any uh, jobs in the, in the feed yard beef sector in Texas? And he said, no, he said, but there's a dairy job in Stephenville, Texas that I know about. And, and, and maybe you might like Stephenville and kind of like College Station, got a university there, but, uh, but uh, why don't you check it out? So I, uh, I took him up on that. And uh, after a couple of interviews later, we, uh, my wife and I moved to Texas, back to Texas, uh, started out in a little town up here in the north part called Steve, uh, Sulphur Springs, Texas for training, but eventually ended up in Stephenville, Texas. And Stephenville, Texas is an interesting place. If you go to a rodeo, uh, anywhere in a rodeo, and they always tell, you know, here's such and such, he's a bull rider, and he's from wherever. It's hard to go to a rodeo without having somebody that's from Stephenville, Texas. It is the rodeo, uh, it's a popular address for rodeo cowboys all over the country. I'm not a rodeo guy, but that, that type of, uh, of uh, setting was good for me. Uh, it's in the central part of Texas, um, within the three-county section right in here, uh, Hamilton, Erath, and Comanche County, Texas. When I showed up there in 1991, there was 100,000 dairy cows in three counties. And, I mean, literally, you drive down the road, there's a dairy here, there's a dairy there, there's a dairy here. It is their neighboring dairies. And so I, uh, I, I thought this was a good place to go if I wanted to learn how to feed dairy cows. So they got this cow in downtown Stephenville, her name is Moolah, and on the other side, it actually says how many dollars of uh, milk sales uh, comes each year out of the, what's the number one dairy county in the state of Texas. So Stephenville is a good place for me. We moved there, we, we uh, learned a lot about dairy. So, go back to my IBM PC picture here. When I first showed up and my trainer you know, they, you show up for a job and they give you some stuff, they give you some, some tools. Well, he, uh, he was an older guy and uh, he gave me these, uh, 
these funny little slipstick cardboard things. And uh, it's just real thick cardboard, and there's little brads on the sides, so they're kind of durable. Throw them in the truck with you. But basically what they were was you could go in here and say what kind of cow you had and whether she was eating alfalfa or Bermuda grass hay and kind of what milk production she was given. And it would you just push it up, and it tells you which feed to buy. Wow, well, that's pretty amazing. Well, this was the old technology that was going out. This was the new technology that was coming in. So basically I came right in the middle of those two where I had to understand some of this stuff, but the future was in doing all that stuff on the computer. So that tied back very well to Dr. Elvin Thomas's class over here in animal science where I took the class out of order. So I wrote an article just recently in Horace Dairyman about this subject. and. Um, in that class with Dr. Thomas, we, uh, we learned about linear programming. And linear programming is basically a way to take um, these inputs and match them to these, these requirements for animals and then let the computer decide what's the cheapest or best way to do it. And so um, that is a tool that I use every day in my, in my current work. And um, there's two ways to feed cows. You can either let the computer help you decide what's the cheapest, best way to do it, or you can just kind of use your intuitive cow feeding skills and say, okay, I think she needs two pounds of soybean meal and 10 pounds of corn and five pounds of alfalfa and 20 pounds of silage. And you can put that in the computer and it'll tell you what the, how much milk that'll produce and whether it keeps the animal healthy. Well, the linear program part of it actually does that, but it does it in a way that's, that finds the cheapest way to do that. And so when I think about those slip sticks and that IBM PC, and then now that we do that on a, on a nice Windows machine or an Apple machine, and uh, truly the computer is smarter than I am at, uh, at building these diets, and uh, that started over there in Upchurch. So my transformation to dairy was a pretty, pretty quick one. I was kind of thrown into the deep end. Um, one of the reasons I picked dairy was, I told you earlier, was I was intrigued with the feedlots because I went to Hereford, Texas, and there were these 100,000 head feed jars, just one after the other, and I thought, this is, a, this is the best thing ever. I went and visited with some nutritionists that had an office in downtown Hereford, and they had an airplane. And I thought that was, that was amazing to, to have an airplane so you could feed cattle um, to fly around these different yards. But in the, in the feedlot industry, to be taken seriously in nutrition, you almost had to have a PhD. And so only having a master's degree, I, uh, I looked at the dairy situation and there was a lot of people feeding dairy cows that didn't have any degree. They were just work for a feed company, figured out how to work the computer. You know, there's so much information. You can make a ration change today and go look at the milk tank tomorrow and see whether you did good. And so there's all this, this, these people that would just kind of learn how to do it and could be actually very good. But I felt like being a guy with biochemistry and microbiology and statistics and stuff and having a master's degree that maybe I could compete better in that pool. Um, so that was one of the reasons that I picked dairy. But the other thing was the industry was exploding in the 90s. Um, milk exports were starting to be a bigger deal, so there was, there was more demand for milk. Um, Texas was a fit for me because I, I liked the Western style. The upper Midwest dairies were probably not as good a fit, but good a fit, whereas the Texas thing was uh, because I kind of wanted to be over there with the brood cow guys and the ranch guys and the cowboy hats and the whole deal. But I was in the dairy deal and it's like a little bit, little bit more of that in, uh, in Texas than there would have been anywhere else. And then my forage interests. So going back to agronomy classes over here and then my, my co-advisor at A&M that was an agronomy guy. And the feedlot deal, they care very little about roughage, very little about forages. Those rations are almost all corn. And so um, the dairy rations are about 50% forage, so it way, way more interested me, but I had a lot to learn. So I put this picture in here, and I'll, um, this right here, so, so if you'd asked me what, what's the dairy business about, I'd have said it's about rubber boots. And I hate rubber boots. I can't wear rubber boots. My feet are not happy in rubber boots. I just wear leather boots and I keep them clean and I make them last a long time. But can anybody tell what that is on those rubber boots? Spurs, spurs on rubber boots. Okay, spurs are usually on leather cowboy type boots. But this guy works at one of our clients' operations where they do heifers and they actually do use horses on these on a, like a 10,000 head heifer feedlot. And uh, that's not something you'll see very often is spurs on rubber boots. But in the dairy business in Texas, you can. 
So it was a good fit for me to learn how to light dairy cows. So like I said, Sulphur Springs is where I started, and that was kind of the dividing line in the country. That's East Texas. Weather a lot like here, very humid. Everything east of that was uh, kind of Midwest type, smaller, uh, more traditional dairies. And Stephenville, which was about, uh, you know, 150 miles to the west of there was the beginning of the west. So once you got to Stephenville, it was like Stephenville, New Mexico, Colorado, Southwest Kansas, and California and Arizona. That was the dairy market. And full of Dutch immigrants, a lot of people from Holland that came here to milk cows that I've gotten to know over the years. Um, people from California that sold land. A lot of the land that Disney <coughs> land is on in Southern California was dairy farms. People sold that kind of land and they showed up in Texas with a lot of money. Lots of money and so they bought nice big dairies in Texas. So my fit was in Texas fit me well, but at that point still Wisconsin and California were the two top dairy states, and they still are. So the upper Midwest, smaller dairies, traditionally they're getting, better, they're getting bigger now. They're, they're growing, the smaller ones are going out and the bigger ones are getting bigger. But when you look at the eastern U.S., um, traditionally they were smaller dairies. Um, Indiana, if anybody ever gets a chance to, to go up I-65 to Chicago, there's a Fair Oaks Dairy Adventure, which is a fantastic uh, almost a theme park for the dairy industry, and those are all people that had dairied in the West that actually moved back to the East to dairy, so the East is changing. But in 1990, when I started, there was none of that going on in the East. Um, the Western dairies, where I was more comfortable, um, they were all about cows. They weren't, they weren't farmers, they weren't growing alfalfa, they weren't growing corn silage. Uh, to them, if they could use the bank to get another cow, they got another cow. They never wanted to own land. They were in places like Chino, California, where there's like million dollar houses here, 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 and then be a dairy right there. And those guys bought all their forages in from uh, the Imperial Valley in California, and they weren't farmers, they were dairymen. Well, those people, as they left Southern California, they moved to places like Texas and Southwest Kansas and Colorado, and they figured out that eventually they needed to learn how to grow things as well as milk cows to be sustainable. So you see a little bit of this in this picture, and I won't go much into it, but. Basically, the, the, the green areas are, I think this is 2000 to 2010. The green areas where cows were coming, and the red areas where cows were leaving. So like you see, uh, uh, this is this part in southwest Louisiana, or southeast Louisiana, southwest Mississippi, just a bunch of dairies down there that fed milk into New Orleans. They left um, dairies here. These areas right here are slightly red, so they actually, those guys left and went here to to Amarillo, Texas, Clovis, Texas, Lubbock, Texas. This area right here, this is uh, El Paso. Those dairies left there because of a, um, of a tuberculosis outbreak and the, the, the government actually bought them out. And these people that left right here are, these, are this, is this green right here where Fair Oaks Adventure is in Indiana. So it's like right here in this spot, there's, I don't know, 300,000 cows there now that used to be right here. This is, this, this is the Disneyland uh, leaving. So those, these guys left and went to the Central Valley of California. They went to, to Idaho. Um, and then, so from our footprint is, here's this little spot in Northeast Colorado. This is why I live in Colorado, is because this little green spot. And this here, Southwest Kansas, is a, is, is, is a rough place to live, but a great place for cows. So, so you see the cows are moving. And so this is where they are now, and it's the same map the same thing again, but you can see the density of dots is where the cows are now. So, um, so this is Stephenville, Texas, where I started. This is Sulphur Springs where I trained. So there's still a lot of cows there, but look at the density here in Amarillo, Lubbock, Clovis, New Mexico, down into Lovington, New Mexico, Las Cruces. Um, this Southwest, this is Garden City, Kansas. This is where some of the largest feedlots are in the world. There's a lot of dairies there too. Uh, Greeley, Colorado. Fort Collins, Colorado, Yuma, Colorado. This is right here. This is where we live and work now. But still a lot going on in the upper Midwest. New York, still giant. Good pockets of dairies here in, uh, in, in, in Florida. And what's the interesting thing about this is where do all the people live? All the people live here, right? I mean, people show up in Auburn and Opelika every day to buy houses. Where did they come from? They came from up here, right? Some of them did. Well, same thing. Cows and people don't, all, people don't always enjoy the same space. So the, what, what that makes, the, what the reality of that is a lot of shipping of milk. So milk trucks, 
all over the road. We, we, we make milk here in Central Texas, and in the summer, when the southeast, what dairies are here, when they're, when they're low on production because of summer heat stress, um, places like Birmingham and Atlanta, Jackson, Mississippi, Memphis, they're, they're deficit milk. So we actually put milk on a truck in Fort Worth, Texas, and ship it all the way out I-20 back to Birmingham to go in the bottling plant in Birmingham. They ship milk from this Indiana corridor right in here at 565. They ship it straight down and hit Nashville. Because plenty of, you know, this is, this is milk excess. There's just milk everywhere up here. And there's a lot of people here too, but there's way, there's way more milk than there is people. Down here, way more people, not a lot of milk. Now the other point I might add to this point is that uh, cheese plants have, have become more flexible in where they go. There's cheese plants here, there's cheese plants here. A giant cheese plant, Clovis, New Mexico and giant cheese plant in uh, uh, Greeley, Colorado. And the, the beauty of cheese is, is that it's very low, it's, it's very low water. So the milk, the milk is like 12% solids and just, it's like shipping water down the road. So you're buying diesel to ship water. Well, if you can put the cheese plant close to the dairy, the milk goes 20 miles down the road to the cheese plant, they make cheese out of it. And then, then they ship the cheese all over the world because cheese is dry. So your, your freight issues shipping a dry product is way better than your freight issues shipping a wet product. So, you know, fluid, some of the milk goes fluid, some of the milk goes to cheese, it depends on a lot of things. And um, so anyway, this is why, I guess this is where I live where I live. Um, I like it here, but there's not many dairy cows here. So, Stephenville, Stephenville was 10 years of my life. Um, in the late 90s, around 2000, um, in this same move that I say here, where this little red's coming in and this green's coming in, um, that was the move to the Texas Panhandle from the, for the central Texas dairies where we were living. So the, the intrigue was low humidity. So cows don't like humidity. They're, they're, they, they like, it's drier the better. Um, mud's bad on cows, uh, humidity's bad on cows, they just can't d dissipate heat like, like they need to in the, in the hot, humid summer. So most people, when I moved to Colorado, everybody said, oh shoot, um, you're going to die the first time it snows, because you're from Texas and Alabama. And I said, well, you don't understand Amarillo, Texas. Amarillo, Texas is, in a, is cold. It's at about 3,000 feet elevation. It's way more like the weather in Colorado than Dallas-Fort Worth. So blizzards, the, the and hot. The last year we lived there, before moving to Colorado, we had a week of 115 in the summer, or 110 at least, with a, like a 40 mile an hour sustained wind, which is very interesting weather to be part of. And then that winter we had a week of negative 20. So it is every extreme. If you want to go live somewhere with extreme weather, check out Amarillo, Texas. But that's all good for cows. Cows, cows don't mind the cold, and they really, really like the low humidity. So dairies like crazy we're going to uh, places like Amarillo, Texas and Clovis, New Mexico right across the line, Hartley, Texas, Dalhart, Texas, Plainview, Texas. And so these counties that are in the Panhandle of Texas, their dairy numbers just started, a dairy industry just exploded in there in 10 years. There were very few dairies up here um, in say 2000 and now it's, uh, there's dairies everywhere and they're big. You know, people are building two, three, four thousand cow dairies there's a cheese plant, Hillmar Cheese built a plant in Dalhart, Texas, which is right there. And that brought Jer Jersey cows in. So we got black and whites and brown cows, which is kind of fun. And this part of the world, there's not many people. There's not many people to complain about the flies or the smell or whatever. And if you have a 2,500 cow dairy that might garnish a lot of attention in, um, outside of Dallas, Texas, if you're a 2,500 cow dairy next to a 70,000 head feedlot outside of Hereford, you're just perfect. Like you're a small farmer up there. Nobody's gonna care about you and they'll just leave you alone and let you do your business. So after a number of years with Purina working in this back and forth between Stephenville and Amarillo, we actually moved back to Alabama for a time and I traveled back and forth. Um, I had the opportunity to leave Purina and go to work for a group called AgriVision Farm Management. And AgriVision was a, was a group of Dutch immigrants that, um, had immigrated to California and then their kids had moved to Texas and they were very, very aggressive in, uh, uh, in using the 
funding, the, the lending available to them through the banks to grow their dairies very rapidly. And so their biggest challenge was not capital to buy land to grow silage or capital to buy cows. Their, their, their challenge was in people. So they decided if they could build a management company that then they could bring people into, then they could develop those people and send them out to manage those farms. And so they wanted a nutritionist, a risk management professional, professional an agronomist, a veterinarian, um, logistics people, human resources people. And so I basically left Karina to go to work for them. And it was fun because I wrote that I got to get on the other side of the desk. So I'd been selling feed and nutrition to dairy farms for 14, 15 years. And now I was actually on the producer side. Though I was still doing rations, still do nutrition work, I actually wasn't selling anything anymore. So it was kind of nice. And I got to do some management, uh, learn some things that I would not have learned otherwise. Um, at the end of a couple of years, it ended up not being my best fit. And uh, I walked into my bosses one day and said, um, I think I need to do something else. And there's a lot of reasons behind that, um, some of which, uh, looking back on it, uh, I may have done some things differently, but the point is I needed to do something different. So at that point, I considered going back to Purina because that door was wide open. And um, I did not want to go back to the feed industry. So I had one of the hard hardest conversations I've ever had. And I sat down with my wife one night and having to come out and say something that's hard, it's like, I think we need to start a business. And uh, so, you know, she basically, so what about insurance and what about benefits and what about that guaranteed salary and what about, what about, what about, what about? And so that was a challenging day, but uh, it was the right thing to do. Um, and so I left the production side of the business in Hartley, Texas, which is a beautiful part of the northern panhandle. Great wheat country. You're there when it's green. It's beautiful. Feedlots and dairies. Very, very nice country. And we started a company uh, called Dairy Nutrition and Management Consulting. And so basically one day I went from having a, a job and a paycheck and the next day it was who's going to be my first client. And uh, so I made some phone calls that day and told some people what I had done and the people that I'd worked with during my Purina years. And we worked very, very hard to make sure that, that Purina relationship stayed strong because that was my heritage. So as, as you leave jobs, leave jobs very, very carefully because you never know who. It's the right thing to do. But even from a self serving standpoint, you never know who you're going to need to relate well to again in the future. So my Purina friends actually were helpful to me. They were glad I was doing this. They felt like they could have a, a friend in the independent consulting world instead of just somebody that's always trying to butt heads with them. And so, um, so we started this company. And um, it was just me. And the, I made a call to a guy and told him, he said, hey, I'd like to be your first client. And that's Caprock Dairy in Muleshoe, Texas. And so I'll never forget the appreciation I have for, for that gentleman to uh, give us a shot to, to, to work with his cows. So this is our website. Um, we, we've, we've really, I think a little bit like I, uh, I hit school at the perfect time from the standpoint of uh, the technology available. If I'd have been five years earlier, I would never have been as good at the computer as I am now. Um, same thing with, with some of the technology that we employ and whether it's social media and, or ag advocacy, the, the things that, we, that we're involved in, this, that are, they're not core to what we do, but they're the, they're the dressing along the sides um, you know, writing articles, giving speeches, um, you know, promoting agriculture, promoting the dairy industry, promoting milk products. Um, I, uh, I came through from the airport last night and got off at the wrong exit and there wasn't anything good to eat, so I pulled into a gas station and, and that gas station was a milk product called Core Power. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with Core Power, but Core Power is, is to, to contrast it to muscle milk, if you read on muscle milk, there's no, it says contains no milk products, which is funny because it's called muscle milk. Well, Core Power is a milk product that's designed by the people that I work for in Hartley and that have the dairies in Indiana at Ferro's Adventure. They basically built a milk product because they saw milk, fluid milk sales going down year to year, cheese consumption going up, but fluid milk sales going down and um, said, what can we do to counteract that? And so they basically built a company, have a milk protein type uh, refuel yourself product product and they actually sold half of it to Coca-Cola in the last couple of years. 
So I think it's going to make them all rich someday. But the cool thing is they were thinking ahead. But anyway, back to my deal. So I'm driving back from Atlanta, and I can't find a gas station. I go in this, I can't find a restaurant. I go in the gas station, and there's, there's core power in the cooler. And so I said, I have something to eat. Got a core power and a cheese stick. Took a picture of it, put it on social media, and say, uh, a quick drive through supper, hashtag dairy, hashtag core power. Okay? So, you know, seven years ago, if I started this stuff, we just may have missed all that. And I don't know whether that stuff ever makes me any money, ever increases my margin, but it keeps me connected to the industry and the people that we, that our team, um, me and then Erica actually lives in South Africa, works full time for us from there on the computer. It doesn't matter where you are anymore, you can connect anywhere. She managed a dairy in Texas for us, and now she's back home with her family and she works full time. Jay Thurman, master's degree in nutrition from West Texas A&M. Uh, he's a consultant with me, and then Rob and Sonadez lives in Washington, and he's a part-time formulator for us. So this is where we work now, and you know, it's very similar to the other map, right? You know, here's this little con concentration here and here, and then Kansas and Colorado, and a little bit up here in Washington, and then these two deals down by Stevenville, Texas. And so we, we put a lot of miles in the vehicle. We drive a lot of that. If you're going to Go from here to here, the airports don't help you much, so you put a lot of miles on vehicles. So I tried to grab some pictures of what it is I do every day. So I have a saying, if you can ever find a way for somebody to pay you to drive in the mud, you have arrived in life. Okay, so this is one of our dairy clients. You can see the Rocky Mountains in the background, and we do get some mud up there occasionally. Um, we, uh, we shake out feed rations in different piles, and we, we we, we uh, sieve out some manure samples, which is kind of odd, to look at what they didn't get digested. We get involved in the trucking part of feed and milk, logistics. Uh, this is one of our commodity areas where basically here's different bays of ingredients and then in my computer, I put those together and this guy loads thousands of pounds of them into this mix and makes about 30,000 pounds of ration to then deliver to the cows that eat at a feed lane like this. Uh, we work a lot on how to keep cows comfortable and housed and cool. We work on cow cooling, uh, what kind of concrete they need to walk on so they don't slip and fall down, how to get them pregnant on time so they can calve again, work with the veterinarians very closely on that. Um, this is a good example of one of our larger dairies. This dairy milks about 6,000 cows in southwest Kansas, and I don't know if you can get a good feel for it, but each one of these lots right here has 500 cows in it. So 500 cows, 500 cows, 500 cows, 500 cows, blah, 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 blah. This is the milking parlor where they have a, you know, milk 100 cows at a time and uh, great family business. It's very big, family business. But at the same time, we actually get to enjoy some animals back on grass. This is taken uh, just outside of Stephenville, Texas. These are mesquite trees. This is a very nice, wet, spring, cool, I mean, green, a lot of, lot of moisture. Uh, very nice picture there. And these are some dairy heifers that are going to be milk cows someday. And so, this is a control center for all that, and uh, you know I, I like this picture to contrast to the picture of the IBM PC in the slide cards, right? So laptop with the ration program on it, um, you know multiple screens, looking at forage analysis on this screen, and doing rations on this screen, and uh, social media on this screen, or a nice screen, just a just a nice screenshot of, of the kick six to to after the kick six, just to remind you where you're from. My desk does not always look that clean. That was actually motivational to me to see that. I'm going to get it back there again. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm running out of time here, but I, you know, what I do is, 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 a, is, is a convergence of biology and economics. So my job is to take the biology that I learned at the basic cell level here and at Texas A&M and what's going on in the room and the things that I can understand my competitor that, that either have, that, that doesn't have the degrees, that just didn't go to school and figured out how to feed cows on his own that can be really good, very competitive type person that can be very good, he's still not going to understand the biochemistry details. He's not going to understand the basics of the microbiology as good as someone that actually took the time to go through that class at their school and understand some of those details. So um, the economic side has come. I mean, I had good economic basis here in some classes. But my clients have basically taught me the economic part of it. I mean, they're good business people, and I've learned. You always learn as much from your clients as they learn from you, and that way you get better. You get better together. 
And one neat, neat thing about the dairy, dairy world, even though calves aren't my favorite, some people really love calves. And I mean, a Dale dairy calf is a cute dude and, uh, or gal, most of them, half of them anyway, and uh, the ones that we work on. And so calves, you know, we have to make sure we know how to do the milk part and the calf feed and the whole deal and then all the way to the milking cows and the cows that are non-lactate and the heifers that are growing. So you get this, as opposed to a feedlot guy, it's like every ration is the same. You know, you got starter ration, you got three or four rations, and then they go to the kill plant. Here we have all kind of opportunity, and I took this picture because cows really do have personalities, and um, I think dairy cows show that better than any other cow because they, they lose their, I mean, you go walk through these cows and they're just, they smell you, they lick you, they got long tongues, they get you wet, they want to know what, why you're in their pen. The heifers follow you around. If you go through a pen of milking cows that actually are first lactation, you know, they'll just glom on you and follow you, and, and that's just kind of fun. <coughs> in our world, a lot of emphasis on records. You know, back to the economics. And this is actually the picture of a, uh, of a weekly report card that we do for our clients where we go basically, this is what Erica does from us from South Africa part of it, goes into their dairy records program, their information at the creamery where they sell their milk to get all their data, how much milk, how many cows, how much butter fat, how much protein, how much do they eat. We feed the cows with computers on the tractors and so we know this pen got you know uh, 10,000 pounds today and there's this many cows in it so we know what their intake was, we know what that costs and we basically can have an ROI for every day on every dairy. So I say he who owns the data owns the power. So if you're gonna get in a, 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 a fight and match with the veterinarian or the banker or whoever it is if I go in with this, all of a sudden they say, well, this guy knows what he's talking about because he's done the, done the work to get the numbers. So this is a watch from a dairy in Clovis, New Mexico, and this, this has their brand on it. So I was leaving a meeting with a son who went to Texas A&M, is a good Aggie friend of mine, and his dad, who's um, 60, I guess, and we had a meeting after we visited the dairy and then he and the son and I were going back to the dairy to look at the cows some more and the dad was walking to his truck and he called me and said, hey, come here. He said, I want to tell you, I thought I was fixing to get fussed at, I was ready. Like, what was fixing to, you know, happen? He said, hey, we had our, uh, our 50th anniversary for our business the other day. I said, oh, I'm 50 years old. That means you're, you, my business and you are this, have the same anniversary. And uh, he said, uh, he said we, got, uh, we did some watches and we gave them to all of our long-term employees. And he said, I got a watch for you to my, to my office. And uh, I was speechless because the fact that we get hired and fired a lot. You have to have a very thick skin to be in our world. You have to be, I, I could get, I, when I go to, I go to my clients about once a month, every client once a month, we got like 13 or 14 clients. Every time I drive down the driveway, I'm, I prepare myself to get fired. And that's a strange way to live. Um, it's a lot of, lot of details, a lot of economics, a lot of pressure, partners, bankers, and sometimes things go really well and sometimes they don't go really well. And you know, maybe it's the nutrition, maybe it's the forages, maybe it's the health issue, maybe it's markets, maybe it's economics, maybe it's attitudes, whatever. But we get fired a lot, so you just have to take it. And I've always said when, when God closes one, one door, he opens another one, and that happens over and over and over. But these people I work for, um, for about 14 or 15 years. And so when someone stays that long, they've been through the ups and downs. There's times that they probably should have said, you know what, we need to change something because we're not doing real well. But they were, they were, they've been committed to us, and, and so when I got that watch, that was a, that's a pretty meaningful, meaningful thing to me. So, so at the end of the day, it's biology, it's economics, putting those two together, but it's, it's about people. The business is about people. Not just the owners, the people that are working for minimum wage as well. Those people are valuable as well. So, you know, we want our clients to say that, that us as their nutritionist is their closest advisor. You know, they have a veterinarian they're very close to, they have a banker they're very close to, they have an accountant that usually they're very close to. But what we try to build is an opportunity to be available for them 24 7, 365. These are dairy cows, after all. That, that big dairy I showed you a picture of, there's no downtime. It's, every hour is the same. All night long, all day long. Go, go, go. And so we kind of live in that world. Never go on a vacation without your laptop. 
it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been that kind of life. And um, so uh, very, very stressful at times, very rewarding, uh, financially rewarding for sure. There's a lot of opportunity, but then again, you have to have that thick skin to be able to take the hard phone call because they will come. This is my crowd. Um, uh, my wife, Tina, is from Vestavia. She uh, you got the BS from here and uh, education. And uh, Ryan and Aubrey live in Birmingham. He's fixing to go on the mission field as a, as a seminary teacher in Africa. Uh, Katie is a sophomore at Colorado State. Mia's in the seventh grade. Tyler is a sophomore here at Auburn in the band, plays drums. And Jake will be here in a year and a half. So. That's my story, and uh, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to, we, we may not have time for questions, but if there are, I'd be glad to entertain them. Yes? Yep, I think when I, uh, when I took that class out of order, and I, so the, any animal science people in here, you're supposed to take feeds and feeding before you took a feedlot management class. And so I took that feedlot management class probably as a sophomore, and, and, and that was where I was introduced to the computer program that formulated rations. And at that point, I was pretty well hooked. Yeah. If you have interest in the the, the, the neat thing about what I've been able to see is um, I, I, I know people that are, I've worked with people that are part of our service team that serve our clients that are salespeople for drug companies, uh, salespeople for additive companies, feed companies, seed companies, uh, the ag bankers, all these people that we have worked with over the years. I have a good feel for what their jobs are like. You know, I know what kind of what makes their business go. And um, so, you know, if, if there's anything that I can do, if you have a question about a career path that's in one of those areas that at the end of the day relates to crop production or, or uh, livestock production, then uh, certainly be glad via email or however to, to help you out. No, no worries at all. Be glad to. Any questions? I got one for you. Yes, sir. So people say you always learn more from Well, like I told you, we've, we, we've been fired a lot. Um, and sometimes when I drive down the, the roads of the Stephenville, Texas area, um, it's, it's a very emotional thing for me because I drive past these dairies. Some of them are sold out now, no longer milking. But I, I can remember where I was for most every time I got that hard phone call. And so every time you get one of those, um, you, you, you say, okay, well, First thing you take it in stride because you know this this is part of this business. You have to be able to handle it, but you always ask yourself, okay, what could I have done different? And so we have. Uh, so the interesting story, the fan. I, I said the part about when I went to work on the other side of the desk in Hartley, Texas, for the farm management company when I left Purina. So that's the DeYoung family, and that's the family that essentially taught me the dairy business because I walked on their farm as a young feed salesman nutritionist, and I caught him on a weekday, and he saw something in me that he thought could help him and. I taught them nutrition, they taught me the dairy business. Okay, so um, other clients the same, but th that was a key relationship in my early years. Well, that, when I went to work for them, um, I, you know, I thought I had arrived. I thought that, that was gonna be, I was gonna be in dairy management, to still do nutrition, but manage the cows and manage the people. And uh, when I left there, um, you know, it, it wasn't perfect. I mean, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't perfect the way that, that we decided that wasn't, wasn't my uh, deal. Well, seven or eight or ten years later, I get a call from them again. Now, the sons, the, the sons of the dads who I worked with have gone to A&M and come back to the dairy. And so they said, we'd like to hire you to, to, to help our boys manage and do these dairies, do the nutrition work for these dairies. Um, a Jersey farm, a Holstein farm, and then a big heifer ranch. And... Uh, and the, uh, we uh, got the hard call the other day that they didn't think it was working out well at the Jersey farm. So we lost that business and you know, I had to just, I just stopped and I thought, you know, it was very emotionally positive to get that business back and build that relationship back again. So how am I gonna feel now about having 
lost this one again. And uh, so, you know, maybe I look back and I, maybe I should have reached out for some help on some details on how the jerseys are maybe more different, a little bit different than the Holsteins. You know, should I have, uh, should I have spent more time at the farm? You know, you always want to know, do you need to be there? Can you do it over the phone? Can you look at records on the computer? Do you need to go put your boots on and walk through the pens and look at the manure, look at the cows, watch the way they're eating, the whole deal? And so you always second guess yourself as to whether you have done that um, adequately when you lose a client. So you can also go crazy with that. I mean, you can, uh, you can always be in a, in a worried state that you're not servicing them well enough to keep them, and that's not good either. And so I think you just have to do the things you know you need to do, do them the best you can, and don't get overbooked. That, that may be a, um, this particular situation wasn't that, but there have been times where I've taken on an extra client or two that I should have passed on because you get the, the new guys get all the attention, it's all new, it's a honeymoon, it's all fun, and then some, some guy that uh, you has worked with you for five years uh, gets a little less of your attention and, and they notice that and that's, that's a big mistake that uh, I have made. Yeah. Don't overcommit. Any other questions? Well, I have to admit that I do longingly drive past. So we moved to Colorado, and I've enjoyed the mountains way more than I ever thought I would. And I am the most intrigued with these mountain cattle ranches. I mean, I drive past those places, and I've got a friend that owns one, and seven or 8,000 feet, these beautiful native pastures with the snow-capped mountains in the background and the, the beef cows grazing that. That is unbelievable. So I, I drive past that and look longingly at that at some point. And uh, so what I've, my answer to that now is that in my – hopefully early retirement, then I'm going to branch out a little bit and look back at, uh, at back maybe some beef cattle opportunities again. We've learned a lot of things in the dairy world that I think can translate back to the beef world, um, and maybe as, as mineral formulations and feeding some byproduct opportunities and things that we feed in the dairy that, that some maybe some cow-calf guys don't think about. Um, but uh, economically, I've been forced to – the dairy opportunity – is, is, is significantly more uh, financially valuable for the service part of it. So the, the amount of service people that surround, a, a, say, a 2,000 cow dairy, veterinarians, nutritionists, feed salesmen, drug salesmen, uh, whatever all those, that army of people are, the same amount of people that it would take to take care of that 2,000 cow dairy, it probably takes less than those number of people to take care of a 100,000 head feed yard. And so, you know, if you, if you went to an animal science meeting and all the, all the salespeople and nutritionists, everybody was in there, um, the room of, of beef cattle people would be pretty small and the, the dairy room would be giant because there's so many more people. And the funny thing is in that dairy room, half of them grew up as beef people. There's all kind of people feeding dairy cows, working in the dairy world that grew up in the beef world and uh, have, have found that the dairy opportunity was a better one uh, from a career standpoint. But I do miss the brood cow model. All right, join me in.